Good evening. Welcome to our webinar, Identifying Workloads to Move to the Cloud. This is the first webinar of our four-part October series called I'm in the Cloud, Now What? Today's webinar focuses on how you can identify the workloads that are ideally suited for the cloud, but also how you can identify the ones that are maybe not quite such a great fit for the cloud. But before we get started, we'd like to ask you a quick question about your experience using the cloud. Poll questions are launching now. And take a moment to answer the following question. Are you using the cloud today? And so we define cloud as infrastructure as a service. So using Amazon EC2 or using Rackspace. And choose the one that is most applicable. So yes, you're in the cloud and you have one or more important projects. And so that could potentially be a couple things in production. Um, yes, you have at least one project that is at least kind of important. Um, you're beginning to explore the cloud, or no, you're simply not in the cloud today. So we'll leave this open for a couple more seconds. And then let's show the results. Okay, cool. So there's um, an interesting distribution here. Over 50% of the audience does have one or more serious projects in the cloud that would be in produ production. Um, and then there's also a good portion of you that's not yet in the cloud or you're just beginning to explore. So. This webinar will be really helpful for helping you to understand what are the best uh, workloads to move to the cloud. So, I'd like to introduce our panel for today. We're joined by Pavel Pragen. He's a professional services architect here at RightScale. Pavel works on customer engagements every single day, and so he has first-hand insight into what works and what doesn't on the cloud. I'm also joined by Ryan Geyer, who is a sales engineer here at RightScale. Ryan works with customers in the pre-sales stage to help them identify projects that are ideally suited for the cloud. Ryan's also quite popular on Twitter, and you can follow him at RJ Geyer. Uh, one of the many great things about GoToWebinar, by the way, is the questions section. So check it out in the main GoToWebinar control panel. We've got Jason Dorfman standing by to answer your questions as they come in. So throughout the course of the webinar, also, Ryan and Pavel will address some of the more broadly applicable questions live on the air. So make sure to ask your questions early and often and use the questions panel at any time. And with that, Pavel, I will hand it off to you. Thanks a lot. Hello, everybody. Um, so hopefully we'll have a good webinar and you'll be... Uh you'll find a lot of useful information out of it. So I want to go over our agenda for today. So first, uh, we're going to talk about the characteristics of an ideal workload. Um, so we picked four special use cases that we see very often working with customers that we wanted to talk about. The first one is going to be about scalable web apps, specifically social media and gaming. The next one is going to be about batch processing things like encoding or any kind of heavy batch uh, calculations like gene sequencing and things like that. Uh, the next one is disaster recovery and last but not least is multi-region, multi-cloud type uh, deployments. So we'll talk about these in, in quite detail. Uh, Ryan and I will kind of switch back and forth and talk about the, the different ones and um, towards the end we'll also talk about some of the bad workloads I guess you could say that are not always the best fit for the cloud and what you can do to kind of get around that. And uh, then we'll have a live Q&A. So I think at this point we're going to have another poll, is that right? Yep, we're getting ready to launch it now. Okay. So I think this poll uh, is um, what is your key consideration for evaluating a workload for the cloud, security, performance, licensing, and cost? And Pavel, we're just going to leave the poll open for another mm -hmm. couple of seconds to give the audience okay. a chance to answer. Sure, sure. <laughs> that <laughs> sounds good to me. And we're going to push the results out now. Okay. Performance. That's interesting. <laughs> and uh, security. That's expecting licensing and cost. Well, I think it's really useful to know. Cool. Thanks, Pavel. We're closing it now. Okay, great. So let's move on to the next uh, slide. Okay, so this is a cool slide. There's not much to say here, but um, essentially what it means is, you know, not every application is for the cloud, but there's room to use cloud for every organization. 
Next. Okay, so this slide um, talks about delivering workload uh, deployment freedom. So essentially, this is kind of a flow chart that takes you from the left where you, you, you identify the applications that you may want to move to the cloud or launch on the cloud. And then you take it through the requirements filter. You see, you know, does it meet your performance requirements? How's, how's cost going to be? What about security, compliance, reliability? And then after that, uh, based on that, you can make the decisions on whether to launch these in public cloud, private cloud, or possibly your internal data center when uh, it may not be a good fit uh, for the cloud. Okay, so to summarize, before we uh, jump in deep on all these different uh, case, um, cases, um, we'll talk about some good workloads uh, for, the, for the cloud. So the first one is unpredictable load or ex explosive growth potential. So this is a big one, and a lot of our customers actually, you know, are interested in that. And of course, social gaming is a great example where people are launching um, social games, and a lot of them, they're startups or small companies, and they don't, don't really always expect high, high traffic, but sometimes those games blow up, and you have, you know, very, very high traffic and a lot of active users, and um, you know, the cloud is a perfect way to be able to, to accommodate that and to scale that on demand. Uh, software is a service product launch. So obviously software as a service is, is a great uh, use case for a cloud because uh, you pay for what you use. Um, e-commerce, there's more and more e-commerce applications moving to the cloud. I think in, in the beginning, you know, it, it, it wasn't the case, but we're seeing much more motion towards that. And of course, uh, blogs. Uh, so the next, uh, next characteristic is partial utilization. So um, some types of applications don't always get consistent traffic across time. There's a lot of fluctuation. So, you know, with an e-commerce application, you know, you have spikes during the day when people are shopping, when they come to work, and things, and things like that. So, um, with the cloud, what you can do specifically with right scale is you can auto-scale based on load. So you can spin up extra servers when the, there's a peak in traffic, and you can spin them down when the peak drops off. So by by doing that. Your, uh, by, by kind of going with that, with that trend and following it, you can save money you know, over time. Um, and of course also, uh, if you're doing some kind of batch processing, you only need the, the resources for short periods of time when you actually need to process the data. And for the rest of the time, you just spin them down. They're not being used. So that's also a really good use case. And um, so what, what applications, I guess, work well with the cloud? Well, um, media streaming works really well, web, websites, web applications. Any application that is easily parallelized or an application that you can uh, scale horizontally easily. Um, if the application can be scaled horizontally, then it's a really good, good use case for the cloud. Next. So now I'm going to turn things over to Ryan to take us to this first uh, use case here. Thank you, Pavel. So the, the first workload that we're going to cover that's a really great fit for the cloud is uh, scalable web applications. We touched on that a bit in the characteristics of great workloads for the cloud, uh, particularly around uh, unpredictable load and, and explosive growth potential. These are certainly things that scalable web apps face. So let's uh, take a look first at the challenges that are faced by a scalable web app. Typically, a scalable web app is going to experience unpredictable traffic spikes. So uh, if a, a link to your site or your web application is sent out and uh, makes its way onto the, uh, in social media, makes a very popular, becomes very popular, then you'll have unpredictable traffic spikes. You might get lots and lots of traffic uh, that you weren't prepared for. So as a result of that, you might also need to scale exponentially. You'll need to scale up your infrastructure very, very quickly to handle that extra load. <clears throat> Excuse me. And of course, in order to do that, uh, you typically are going to need to scale very quickly and do that with very few people. Uh, and so you need a high level of automation to be able to really uh, increase the size of your infrastructure. So the ways in which the cloud really helps you do those things is, is as follows. Um, by 
using the cloud, you have that automatic scaling capability. So monitoring the load of your application, uh, you can determine that you need more servers, that you need to expand your infrastructure, um, and you can automatically add new resources to the pool to, add, to handle that additional load. Uh, and effectively, you have an unlimited resource pool on demand uh, as you experience these spikes in traffic. So this is really limited only by the underlying cloud provider. So uh, if you're using Amazon or Rackspace or one of the public cloud providers, the resource pool that's uh, accessible to you is their entire resource pool. So the other strength for using scalable web apps in the cloud is, again, that you only pay for the resources that you use. So you're not running that entire infrastructure that might handle the peak load that you might expect for the entire time and the entire lifespan of your application. You only pay for that extra capacity when you need it, when you have those spikes in traffic. And then, of course, uh, when you use RightScale to manage your infrastructure, manage your deployment, uh, we give you the automation tools and ease of operations to really easily launch those new servers, get them uh, connected to your the rest of your deployment, to your load balancers, your databases, and so forth. <clears throat> so next we're going to show you uh, an, ex uh, an example architecture of a scalable web app, and this is actually uh, from uh, a customer that we actually built this infrastructure out for. So to show you just a little bit of the interesting pieces of it, uh, on the right-hand side here we've got a message queuing system that's built on RabbitMQ. Uh, and that queuing system, as messages are handled, is storing some key value pairs into a React database, uh, key value pair database. Um, and this is load balanced. This is a, a non-auto scaling tier, but using server templates with right scale, you can very easily add additional servers to uh, that tier as well to handle increased load. Next, we have the MySQL database tier for storing persistent data for the application. And then that is front-ended by memcached for performance reasons. Then the really interesting piece is right here in the center. This is the auto-scaling Python application tier. And using RightScale uh, monitoring and alerting uh, technologies, you can actually automatically scale this tier of your architecture um, as additional load comes in. So we can actually, using monitoring, detect that there's a high level of CPU use or a high number of incoming requests to your application and automatically add additional Python application servers. Uh, connect them to the load balancer automatically using scripting. Connect them to your persistent and key value pair uh, stores automatically using a script as well, uh, effectively matching the demand for your application in real time by auto-scaling. So I think, are there any questions about this in the Q&A? Nope? Okay. Uh, just as a reminder, we're going to probably stop at the end of each one of these workloads to give you an opportunity to uh, ask questions and get those answered. Uh, so if you have questions at the end of each one of these workloads, go ahead and, and send them out, and we'll, we'll address them in real time. So, Pavel, the, this is the next workload. Okay, thanks. So uh, this one is going to be about batch processing. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so what are some of the batch processing challenges um, when it comes to encoding or crunching numbers or anything like that? Um, need extremely high processing power. So we, we need to have the ability to throw a lot of resources at encoding or processing, computing, things like that. And um, th th that capacity, that, that processing power needs to come from somewhere. Uh, need to process huge workloads. So usually with batch jobs, with encoding or any kind of number crunching, they're usually very big workloads that need to be processed quickly. And traditionally, using you know, regular servers and a set number of resources, there's also a kind of a, a defined period of time that it will take to process, and historically, sometimes it takes uh, a very long, very long time. So um, that's another challenge. 
uh, need to process workloads fast. So kind of like what I just said, you know, we, we want to be able to throw a bunch of resources at it and just get it done, you know, and get the results back to whoever's looking for them or get the videos encoded for somebody. And uh, of course, the fluctuating fluctuating utilization cycle, which means um, that with these types of workloads, um, the resources are not used consistently. There's a lot of spikes, so today we may need to do a huge uh, batch, and tomorrow will be nothing. So we we need to make uh, we don't want to be wasting resources. So it's another another challenge. Uh, next. Okay, so um, batch processing cloud strength. So how can we leverage the cloud to, um, to help us with these challenges? Well, first of all, out of scaling on demand using metrics. So what does this mean? Well, um, what this means is you can have um, an out of scaling tier of encoding servers, for example, and then you can have a queue, like ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ or even a database that stores jobs that, for, that need to be done. Uh, there could be encoding jobs, for example. And then um, based on the numbers of items in the queue and based on how many items are being processed in each server using those metrics, we can auto-scale and add extra servers based on that. So if we have, you know, a thousand, um, a thousand things in the queue and one server can only process ten things at the same time, we can spin up a hundred servers to just crank it out. Um, bring up large numbers of servers fast. So when you're using a private cloud or a public cloud, especially a public cloud, um, most of the time you have virtually unlimited um, computing resources. So you can tap into that at any time for any period of time that you want and give them back. Um, throw huge numbers of servers at the problem. So I think it's basically the same thing I just said. Uh, we just use as much resources as we need to, to, to get things done. And uh, pay for what you use and when you need it. Um, again, we take advantage of being able to pay for what we use, bring resources online, and retire them when we're done. And that helps out with with the costs. Next. So this is an example architecture um, that we did for a, for a customer a while back. And, uh, Essentially, this is a social application with an encoding component uh, that allows uh, people to upload their videos and encode them and have them served from the site in a, in a different format. Um, so uh, can you go to the next slide that highlights the, yeah. So uh, this um, part here is an auto-scaling array of squeeze, Sorens and squeeze servers, which are encoding servers. And um, they actually do all the all the crunching, all the encoding, and this can scale based on load. And on the bottom, uh, the database servers are actually the ones that uh, hit uh, where the queue is to keep track of all the jobs that are that are running. Um, and these are the primary parts um, of this architecture that have to do with batch processing. Everything else is, is different, so I'm not going to go into it. Um, so I think that's all for the, for this slide. So um, the next uh, one up is disaster recovery, and, and Ryan is going to get that one. Thank you, Pavel. So disaster recovery is the next workload that we're going to look at. So let's take a look at what the challenges are for disaster recovery. Uh, obviously, for disaster recovery, you're going to need infrastructure in a different location than your production environment. Uh, and so that's in case of a disaster or a problem with power or cooling in that uh, production data center you need to have the same set of resources uh, ready to be run in a different location and a different data center so that you can keep your website up and keep your application going. Of course, in order to do that, you don't really want to pay for the hardware that's a, an exact duplicate of your production environment in another data center uh, if it's really only going to sit idle for uh, most of the time. You know, fingers crossed you don't have a disaster that requires the use of your disaster recovery site. <clears throat> Excuse me. You also need to be able to uh, get that new deployment, that disaster recovery infrastructure, uh, set up and cut over to it very quickly uh, and do that so that you don't have a great deal of downtime for your application. And then, of course, uh, the other challenge is to really have a, a robust 
disaster recovery plan and a robust disaster recovery site, um, but have it be affordable. Um, again, sort of touching on the other points of uh, having a lot of hardware that sits idle is, is not very cost effective. So how can the cloud really help with this? Well, of course, uh, you have the opportunity to use any public or private cloud that uh, you might gain access to as, uh, from a third-party service provider, um, which means that you have access to very geographically diverse data centers, um, and data centers that might even have different strengths as far as uh, performance or your ability to replicate data to it and so forth. Um, and then when you're using cloud computing, you really have the opportunity to run a scaled down version of your deployment in the disaster recovery site. So a great example of this is that you might run your full live production site uh, in your production data center in the production cloud of your choosing. Um, and then in your disaster recovery site, you'd really only run a replica replicating slave database, or perhaps several if you need uh, multiple databases to support your workload. So those are really the only servers that are always on in that uh, disaster recovery site, which means you're paying for really only those servers and not all of the additional application servers, load balancers, and so forth that are necessary for the full deployment. So certainly you're able to, to save money in doing that. And then, of course, uh, when you're using the cloud and when you leverage WriteScale, you're able to use server templates and the write scripts that are associated with them to very quickly launch the rest of the deployment uh, that isn't currently running. So you would then launch all of your, your application servers, your load balancers, uh, and use the automation tools that WriteScale provides you to get those servers talking to one another and get your uh, disaster recovery deployment set up and, and operational very quickly. And that, that touches too on that last bullet there of uh, being able to do that very quickly using all that automation, uh, making it a very smooth process and also something that you can uh, test on a fairly regular basis. Uh, in a typical disaster recovery uh, scenario with typical disaster recovery plans, uh, it's difficult to really stage that test and, and run it. And if your architectures aren't precisely the same, running the same hardware on either location, your production and your disaster recovery site, you can run into issues when you actually do have an emergency and you have to switch over. Uh, again, leveraging write scripts and server templates and, and the automation that WriteScale provides really allows you to make sure that the two environments are identical and give you the tools to really test that DR. Uh, scenario on a regular basis. So we're going to show you real quickly an um, example disaster recovery architecture. So really what we're seeing here is just the disaster recovery side of the infrastructure. Um, you can imagine on the right side of this uh, an identical infrastructure that's a the production infrastructure. And what you see is uh, under this box here is a set of three slave databases, uh, in this case Postgres. And those are really the only servers that are always on and always running in your disaster recovery environment, which means you're only paying for those servers um, and the bandwidth going into them. All the rest of the servers that you see, including the auto-scaling array just to the left of the databases there, uh, are not running. Uh, but in WriteScale, you would actually have those servers set up to run sort of a skeleton of your deployment that defines the number of application servers that you would run, um, the elastic load balancer that you would set up, the uh, SES simple email service that you would have uh, ready to go in your disaster recovery site. And then in the case of a, of a disaster, a situation where you would need to switch over to this environment, it's just a matter of launching each of those servers in the correct order uh, using the automation tools that would get them connected to the load balancers, connected to the databases, uh, and then lastly, failing over your master database to the slaves that are running in the disaster recovery site, uh, and lastly, switching over DNS, making it a very smooth and quick transition. And I, there was a question of why not uh, put a slave database in uh, Amazon US West for disaster recovery. That's precisely what we're describing here is actually having a separate uh, production site and disaster recovery site that could be in different Amazon availability zones, 
uh, or in completely different regions if that's uh, necessary for your SLAs. So the next workload is multi-region or multi-cloud, and this one is you, Pavel. Great, thank you. All right, sounds good. So uh, let's go through this one. Oops. Ooh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So multi-region, multi-cloud challenges. Um, so first of all, what's multi-region? Multi-region, for example, is being able to launch uh, servers or applications in two different Amazon regions, for example. Or multi-cloud is where you have something launched on Amazon, and also you can launch something on Rackspace at the same time, or private cloud. So what are some of the uh, challenges or some of the for some of the, for the I guess needs that could require these technologies so one of them is not having a public cloud in your location so you may be located somewhere in the world where you don't have a, a public cloud in, in, the, in the locale and you have business requirements that require you to have some kind of a cloud resource in, in that location um, have, needing to be able to burst uh, to public cloud. So you may have a private cloud set up in your data center. Um, you have, you're using southwellcloud.com on top of your uh, hypervisor. Um, you're using that resource, it's a cloud resource on the private side. But uh, sometimes you have very big um, traffic spikes and you want to be able to burst to public cloud to meet those requirements and then go back to using your resources in private cloud. So that's another challenge requirement. Needing better performance, so uh, sometimes uh, people require specific uh, performance characteristics from the I.O., CPU, memory, or any kind of uh, very resource intensive um, workloads that they're doing, and sometimes public cloud doesn't meet those performance requirements, so uh, this is when, when you can enable using um, multi-cloud and having some resources in private cloud where you can do more customizations, pick your own hardware and optimize things and use public cloud for the rest, the rest of the things. Um, the next thing is high cost of public cloud at huge scale. You know, most people don't really ever have to worry about this, but uh, if you get really big and you're using thousands and thousands of servers on Amazon, it can get really expensive over time. So it becomes more um, cost effective to buy your own hardware and deploy your own uh, private cloud and use those resources instead. And of course, uh, challenges and cost of disaster recovery, like we talked in the previous uh, slide, is you know um, organizations require disaster recovery sometimes for regulation to where they need to use not just different geographies but also different vendors. So, for example, you'll have um, some of your infrastructure or all of your infrastructure for production on Amazon, and you'll have a disaster recovery site on Rackspace. So to meet those requirements, you need to be able to do multi-cloud. Multi uh, next. Okay, so how does uh, right scale and cloud uh, can, can meet these uh, requirements, okay? So right scale enables you to deploy multiple clouds and regions seamlessly. So the way we do it is we, we, have, we use this uh, technology called multi-cloud multi uh, images where we have images to launch in different clouds. We have templates and scripts um, that kind of abstract um, the, uh, the, actual, the actual image and the setup of the server fr from the user to where you can customize just uh, specific ways you want to build out the, the servers. And uh, when you have general uh, multi-cloud images, you can build on those seamlessly regardless of you know, where, where they're launched. Um, so right scale enables you to launch on, on multiple clouds and multiple regions, basically seamlessly. Um, private cloud can be set up in any data center anywhere. So if you need to deploy a cloud in a location where there's no public cloud, you can find a good data center. You can engage somebody like cloud.com. You can set up uh, that cloud, and then, and then right scale can tap right into that, and you can start, start launching servers there pretty much right away after that. So it gives you very big flexibility. Uh, bursting to public cloud for more resources, like I talked about earlier, 
Um, you can utilize public cloud to burst when your private cloud resources uh, are exhausted or close to being exhausted. Achieving better performance with private cloud by picking out your own hardware and optimi optimizing your private cloud specifically for your workloads. And um, the next one is uh, saving money by buying your own hardware when it comes to very large scale and large deployments. Uh, so can we go to the next slide? We can look at the architecture. Okay, so this is an example. I can see a lot of questions about this one. <laughs> so um, this is an example architecture of an active-active multi-region deployment. So here we have an application that is deployed on US East and it's deployed in US West. We have uh, multi-regional uh, MS SQL replication using merger application between the different regions and we have global traffic management on top using uh, something like Akamai and um, using this architecture we can achieve very high levels of uptime uh, levels of uptime that you cannot really achieve um, without having an active-active type setup in two different regions. We're talking about like three or four, you know, 99.999 uptime. Um, so this type of architecture historically was pretty much unaffordable for most organizations. The reason is you had to have two different data centers, you had to have all the hardware in two places, you had to utilize very high-end load balancing, global traffic management hardware solutions, and uh, it was pretty much um, only for big, uh, big enterprises out there that could do this. And, uh, and the good news now is that using cloud and, and, uh, and right scale, this is, this is within reach for, for much smaller organizations. If they have these requirements, you know, we can do this. So this is really awesome. Um, so I don't know if we have questions about this one or we want to go to the next, next slide. So, Pavel, can you talk a little bit about um, the ramifications of replicating data between different uh, regions and different clouds? Right. Yeah. Um, so, of course, whenever you're replicating data between regions or clouds, you're going over the Internet, and uh, it's kind of an unknown territory. You cannot guarantee uh, throughput. You cannot guarantee... Uh, even availability and connectivity between different places like this. So you have to specifically account for latency with replication uh, because you have to expect that there will be some latency with replication and the data when it's committed on one location it won't be, it won't show up at the other location right away. So you need to design your application to be able to handle that. So your application needs to be tolerant of that kind of latency. Um, like we talked about earlier, you know, applications, it's not really about the cloud here, it's about just being able to do this kind of uh, active, app, active type setup. You need to customize your application to work with it. You cannot just expect, you know, to take your app, whatever it is, and just, just dump it on a bunch of servers and expect it to work in this kind of a complex environment. So if you can customize your application to work and account for this latency, then you can make this work. Thank you, Paul. And another thing to point out, too, is that the, the two different environments that are completely in different clouds, uh, using the right scale technology and using server templates, as, as Paul pointed out earlier, assures that both environments are exactly identical, something that's a lot more difficult to do with traditional infrastructure and traditional mm -hmm. configuration methods. Yeah, definitely. And about change control as well, being able to make a change on one site and have it uh, be replicated at the other site on like script down to the script you know server level. Great. Let's go to the next. Okay, so now that we covered all the good all the good stuff, <laughs> I want to touch on a couple of things to watch out for. So since we work with a lot of customers, we run into all kinds of requests, all kinds of applications, and once in a blue moon, we run into um, specific requirements that are not the best fit for the cloud with application the way the way it is. And I, I, I want to reiterate again that, you know, the application really needs to be able to work with the cloud and sometimes it just can't because it's a legacy application or it cannot be redesigned. So there are situations like that. 
So one of them uh, situations is very high performance applications, disk I.O. network. So um, there's some proprietary uh, databases that require very high I.O. And they cannot really tolerate any kind of variation. They expect a consistent, you know, ability to read and write uh, from the disk uh, systems. So with the cloud, in general, you know, we're using shared resources that a lot of people are using most of the time. And uh, performance varies. And, you know, the good news is that most of the time it doesn't vary that much. But um, with these types of databases, you can have that. So you need to find other solutions like using private cloud or using dedicated hybrid type, type, type configurations. Um, same thing for applications. You may have some application that needs to uh, write files to the file system at a very high rate, and if they don't get there fast enough, it could cause problems. Um, no tolerance for I.O. For IO performance fluctuations. I already covered this. Um, high performance storage um, requirement. You know, we, we have uh, different options for storage on different clouds, and for example, Amazon has EBS storage, which performs fairly well especially if we do Stripe configurations and things like that, but sometimes that's not even enough. So poor application design. Some applications, even I see a lot of applications that are being designed from scratch now, not legacy. People are not designing applications in mind, in mind with where they're going to launch it and how they're going to run it in production. Because I, it's, my, it's my belief that when you're designing applications these days, you need to be thinking from the beginning, how are you going to launch it, how are you going to scale it, and how is it going to be highly available on the system side, not just the application. And of course, your legacy and enterprise apps, uh, they just, it may just not, not work for you. Um, the next one is latency, and that plays into the network piece. Uh, we've run into some databases also um, that require very high throughput replication and clustering. Uh, between them, some analytics, Special, specialized analytics databases and others that require very steady high throughput between them. So sometimes this uh, we can't really do it uh, effectively on the cloud right now. Uh, legacy enterprise apps need for high performance network storage. Um, so what happens a lot of the time is when people are moving their applications from from your typical setup at a data center. They want to continue to use uh, things like uh, net network touch storage, like NFS. And, um, you know, in a data center, you can get pretty decent performance out of a NAS, like a NAT app or something like that, where it may give you what you're looking for. But if you want to set up an NFS server in the cloud, first of all, you, it's really difficult to make, make it highly available. And secondly, it, uh, it won't perform well. So if you want to use that, you may, you may have problems. So typically what people do is they, they try to use S3 or use things like Gluster and other solutions to, to get uh, storage, shared, shared storage for their applications. And the last one is some applications just have specific hardware dependencies that we may not be able to fulfill on, on the cloud right now. Um, I think that's all for this slide. So, Pavel, there, there was actually a question um, that asked, with the announcement of Direct Connect service from Amazon, uh, will this change the network concerns of uh, what are bad workloads? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, if, if you are able to locate a data center, that will work with that. And, uh, and you can uh, do some benchmarking, and you're, and you're comfortable with the performance that you're getting. I think so. Um, I always think that whenever you're trying to uh, deal with performance, load testing, any kinds of those things, you always you always have to do testing. You can't rely on you know, specifications or guarantees or SLAs. You just you have to test it and you have to see if it's going to work for you. Yeah. So I think uh, to to expound on that a little bit, certainly it's going to help with network throughput. Uh, that that's sort of implied with the Direct Connect service. Um, you will want to test it, to Pavel's point. Uh, but there's also the consideration that you're running your uh, cloud-based instances still on a shared infrastructure. Uh, so there's going to be fluctuations in even its network availability and its uh, network I.O. capabilities. So again, that really underscores the, 
the fact that you're going to want to test it and make sure that it meets the SLA of your application. Yeah, there's there's a lot of moving parts. So, unless there are any other questions, we'll, we'll wrap it up. What we really wanted to highlight at the end here is that, uh, again, from the, the beginning of the, the webinar, we discussed that there's really room for uh, every firm, every company to really consider cloud computing uh, for their workloads. It may not be, as we discussed, uh, an excellent fit for every single application in your portfolio, uh, but we here at RightScale have been putting workloads in the cloud for uh, nearly five years, and we have a great deal of experience on really what makes a great workload for the cloud, uh, and also which workloads might be a better fit for public cloud or private cloud or even a mix of public and private in your hybrid cloud environment. So uh, we encourage you to, to contact us using the, the phone number or the email or uh, getting in touch with us on the website. Uh, we can help you take a look at the workloads that you may be looking to move to the cloud and uh, find the best resource pool to put them in. Cool. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks, Pavel. Um, we'll stay online for a couple more minutes. If you have any specific questions about maybe a specific project that you're working on today, or if you'd like Pavel or Ryan's input or feedback on whether a workload is what we would you know, call a good ideal workload or maybe something that's not so good. Um, so yeah, we'll be here for a few minutes. I highly recommend that you take this opportunity to ask them your questions because they're definitely part of RightScale's brain trust. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to do a brief wrap up. So like Ryan mentioned, on the slide here, there's our contact information. So feel free to reach out to the team at RightScale. Um, you'll have an opportunity to talk with people like Pavel or people like Ryan. Uh, we are also able to offer an um, architecture assessment, so just like the architecture diagrams on the previous slides throughout the webinar, we'd be happy to look through whatever your particular architecture is and give feedback on um, how that should be best designed for the cloud. So our contact info is there. If you'd like more information on educational resources, RightScale has a wealth of information on our website, so check out rightscale.com slash webinars for webinars dating throughout the past, you know, two to three, I think even some from uh, a couple webinars from 2008, so that just highlights how long we've been in the space and how much experience we have. We also have a series of white papers that are quite interesting. And if you'd like to take it to the next level and check out for yourself how RightScale works, just go to rightscale.com slash free, and you can sign up for the RightScale free edition where you'll be able to see a lot of this in action. Um, and you can check out our support site at support.rightscale.com as well for specific tutorials and guides and information on how to get started. I'd like to point out that, uh, again, this is the first webinar in our I'm in the Cloud Now What series. Next week, we've got Rafael Saveja, our VP of Engineering at RightScale, who will be talking about optimizing cloud applications in RightScale. This is a presentation that Raphael gave at our user conference back in June, and it was very highly rated. So we're offering it to you next week as part of this webinar series. I highly recommend that you check that out. Also, our next RightScale conference is coming up in the beginning of November in Santa Clara, California. You can register for that. The registration is free, by the way, um, which is an amazing value because at least 30 people from RightScale will be there, and you will have the opportunity to meet with them and talk specifically about what you're trying to achieve. Um, Ryan Geyer will be there at the Genius Bar, so you can meet him in person. Our customers will be there. You'll have an opportunity to meet them. We'll also have many partners there as well. So as far as that being a free day, super high value. I recommend that you go. You also get a free pass to the Cloud Computing Expo. Um, so just register for that, rightscale.com slash conference. And uh, I don't think that we've had any more questions come in in the past few minutes. Um, let's see here. I think, I think that we're good. But you know what? If you continue answer, asking your questions, Jason Dorfman will be standing online behind the scenes and can answer those for you. Uh, one thing I'd like to say before I conclude is that this webinar has been recorded. So if you'd like to share with your friends and colleagues and maybe your family, you can check that out later today. It will be online on our site. We'll send an email out to you tomorrow once that's posted. Um, otherwise, thanks so much for your time and have a great day. Bye.